Doug Heron was born and raised in New York, Huntington, Long Island. His parents are both educators. When he was young, he would argue with his father, and you could say that was a hint what was in store for his future career. Doug went on to James Madison University, where he majored in political science and history with a minor in criminal justice. He spent some time in law enforcement right after college before he got into law school at Penn State. What made Doug get into law enforcement? What is the most meaningful thing in his career? What is the one thing very few people know about Doug socially? Check out Doug Heron as he shares his journey in this new episode of State Lobbying Heroes. Hey Doug, thanks so much for being on the show. Oh, thank you for having me. Let's go into the rapid fire sort of questions. Okay. If you were the governor for a day, what would you be doing? Oh, wow. The power that I would have, huh? Well, I think everything that I have been working on in the last year and a half, not unlike a lot of folks, is through the lens of COVID. Um, so I think from my perspective, given uh, what I see happening every day at Duke, um, I would take some certain steps or reinstitute certain measures that the governor has walked away from recently uh, to help curtail the impact of COVID um, on the population of North Carolina, but also on the, on the workforce, uh, the healthcare workforce in North Carolina, specifically from my perspective at Duke. Um, so I think that the governor ought to go back to some of the restrictions that were in place at this time last year. What is the one myth or misconception about lobbying? I think that the perception of lobbyists is probably gained through television, television shows um, and that a lot of what we do is what I would characterize as political influence when what I consider most of what we do as lobbyists to be advocacy um, and whether it be um, a contract lobbyist has a number of different clients or someone like myself who works for a, a large health system and university um, we are generally advocating for what is in the best interest of our, our employers or clients. Um, and most of the issues that I work on, it often comes as a surprise to a lot of my friends who really don't understand what lobbyists do, um, are in the healthcare space for things like increasing access to healthcare, and then in the education space about improving the quality of higher education as delivered in North Carolina. And I'm not sure who could argue against that. So I think it's often a surprise to folks to to learn what it is exactly that I advocate for. What would you be if you weren't a lobbyist? Oh, that's an easy one. I'd be a police officer. <laughs> good answer. <laughs> what three skills do you think are essential for someone to be a good lobbyist? Uh, without a doubt, first and foremost, you have to be trustworthy. Um, your word, your reputation is everything in lobbying. Uh, secondly, you need to be... Uh, student and a, uh, an expert on your issues, so subject matter expert. And then third, you need to have pretty thick skin. Um, none of this is personal. I've had legislators, you know, yell at me. Um, and I know that they're not yelling at me, they're yelling at either my, my employer or my issue. Um, so, and, and of course, other lobbyists who are friends of mine, uh, we sometimes go at each other on, on, on issues. And at the end of the day, we're all friends, but you need to have thick skin for sure. What is your favorite book or hobby? Oh, gosh. My favorite hobby is certainly my children uh, and following their, their athletic careers. Uh, I have a daughter who is now a competitive cheerleader on the cheerleading team at NC State and a son who plays what they call showcase travel baseball. So that is my, my hobby without a doubt. And um, I, I will read anything um, having to do with politics or military history. That, that, those are my interests. Nice. What inspires or motivates you to be doing what you're doing? Um, I'm amazed uh, by what I, I learn new about Duke every day. Um, not only the discoveries that are made, but the people behind them. And those folks really keep me motivated. Their dedication to research, to delivery of healthcare, to you name it, um, really keeps me going. What is the one thing you would like to share which none of my listeners know about you. Oh, wow. Um, but I'm actually a pretty relaxed and social and fun guy. I think I give off the, uh, 
the perception when I'm at the legislative building of being pretty high in sight and, and, uh, and pretty firm in my beliefs and such, but I'm a pretty, uh, pretty relaxed person when it comes to going out socially. And I think there's two sides of me and I don't think my lobbying colleagues really get to ever see that fun side of me. I'm kind of the jokester amongst my friends socially. And I think that would surprise a lot of people that I lobby with in Raleigh. <laughs> what is the most momentous thing in your career? Um, so, um, probably the most recent momentous thing that I worked on was reopening a hospital in Franklin County, North Carolina. Um, the hospital had closed up there, uh, Duke Life Point, which is part of Duke Health System, um, reopened the hospital up there and we had to achieve a number of different legislative changes and some regulatory changes to get that done and also work with the community to get that hospital reopened, which meant a increased access for the delivery of healthcare, increased access for healthcare uh, in Franklin County and return of the delivery of healthcare up there. So that's probably the biggest thing. Nice. If you had to describe the North Carolina legislative process in one word, what would it be? Oh, convoluted. Okay. <laughs> With that, let's jump into your past. Can you tell us where did you grow up and how was your childhood like? Was there any glimpses of politics back then? Sure. So I grew up in New York. I'm from Huntington, Long Island. I don't really have the accent, and that's uh, because my mother, who was an English teacher, uh, was very adamant about us speaking clearly and not with a New York accent, not because we weren't proud of where we lived. We just wanted to make sure we spoke perfect English. Um, and uh, so both my parents were actually educators. My father was a teacher and that's how my parents met. Uh, they were teaching at the same school together. My father asked my mother out and she said no the first two or three times. I finally gave in, she finally gave in and said yes. Uh, two older sisters, I was the, obviously the youngest. Um, pretty normal life growing up in New York. Um, I played sports growing up, very socially active. The uh, hint, I guess you could say, of, of my future when I was younger was that um, I like to argue, um, and my father, who was uh, more liberal uh, than he probably cares to admit, um, I like to argue with him, so I would usually take the opposite point of view, which meant that I would take the conservative or Republican point of view on a lot of issues we would debate at the kitchen table or around the dining room table over holidays, um, and I eventually was referred to as the Alex P. Keaton of my family, which is a reference to the Family Ties character, of course. Um, it was the Republican pro-Reagan conservative teenager um, in that family. And so that's, that's really when I started to think that um, I might enjoy getting involved in politics. And that's kind of what started it all for me. Oh, nice. And after your high school, and were you in New York until high school? Yes, uh, born and raised in New York all the way through, graduated high school, and then went off to college in Virginia, which was quite a uh, culture shock for me, quite a difference uh, of, a lot of things were different, let's put it that way. <laughs> and, so what, from New York. and so what made you move to Virginia, and what was the uh, degree you picked? Sure, so my sister actually preceded me uh, to college in Virginia. She went to Virginia Tech as an architect major. Um, I was looking at schools like Penn State, Michigan. I wanted to go to a Big Ten school with a big football program. Um, but when we went down to see my sister at Virginia Tech, we passed James Madison University, which is on the same interstate in uh, Western Virginia. And my father, uh, who was still teaching at that point, had mentioned that a couple of his quote unquote favorite students had picked James Madison University because of all the great things that it had to offer. And he encouraged me to look at it and I reluctantly uh, stopped to look at JMU once, one time going down to see my sister and fell in love with it. And that, you know, ultimately was where I decided to go to school. Um, and I majored in political science and history with a minor in criminal justice. Oh, wow. So, so at that point, you made up your mind when you picked political science, you knew that you wanted to pick that. Is that how it happened? Yes, yeah, sort of how it happened. I, you know, going back now, if I could do things a little differently, having a freshman uh, my daughter was a freshman at NC State and seeing all the different majors that are uh, offered these days, I might have done something a little bit differently. I, I didn't pick political science because I really wanted to go necessarily into politics um, or lobbying. Um, I picked political science because it was just kind of what I did socially. I read about politics, was interested in watching political debates and things of that nature. And um, I actually 
uh, eventually decided I wanted to be a federal law enforcement officer. And I thought that would be the best way, you know, one of the better degrees to have for whatever reason to go into the FBI, DEA or something like that. Of course, that didn't happen. I uh, ultimately ended up in law school, but um, you know, I was just uh, navigating my way through college and figuring that political science was just a good degree to have. Oh, wow. So if you, like you said, you know, if you had to change the things which you had picked, like what would you change? What degree would you would have chosen? I probably would have gone with a, at least a minor in some business degree, whether it be accounting, finance, business in general, um, something that would have given me a little bit more, uh, more options uh, if I decided that I wanted a career change at a young age or an early age with ha not having to go back to school and get another bachelor's or something like that. So that's just, that's me looking back 30 years later. Um, not at the time, it didn't obviously occur to me, but uh, I did make a, uh, I told my daughter as she was, you know, deciding on a major at NC State, I said, you can do whatever you want in terms of a major, but you have to promise me if you're not majoring in something in business, finance, economics, you have to at least take a minor in that so that you're properly equipped to enter the real world. That's what I was missing when I majored in political science and history. Oh, interesting. So after your bachelor's, you went into getting a law degree, is that right? Not right away. I spent, a, I spent some time in law enforcement right after college. Um, and then, you know, local law enforcement, police department, um, and then was told by an FBI recruiter that the best way uh, to be deemed competitive to get in the FBI was to go to law school. And this was, of course, before 9-11, before a huge uh, hiring, uh, you know, bonanza that they went on. So it was very, it's a different environment back then. Um, and the FBI recruiter told me, you know, if you want to be a police officer for 10 or 15 years, do that. If you want to go into computer science, get a master's in that or do that, or you can go to law school. And I said, great, I'll go to law school. <laughs> so that's actually how I ended up in law school. Oh, wow. So, so what made you get into um, law enforcement? Something I always really uh, always saw myself doing and had a vision of being a career uh, police officer or FBI agent. That's just the way that I viewed myself when I was a teenager, that I would ultimately eventually do that. Now, when I went to law school, uh, things changed, um, as they often do when you're in your mid to late twenties and you and you, you meet someone you want to marry. You know, <laughs> things change. Um, oh, so, so yeah. what changed in? Yeah, so please tell us, like you know, what happened in the law uh, school that you know looks like somewhere something happened there which changed your career path. It did. Um, I did get engaged during law school, which uh, for me was a obviously. A uh, huge uh, decision, a uh, life decision, and uh, did not want to be subject to the whims of the FBI moving me all over the country. I knew basically where I wanted to at least settle initially after law school, which was in the Washington, D.C. area. Uh, that's where my wife is from. Um, but I did my first two years of law school up at Penn State, and then my last year of law school after I got engaged at George Mason University in Northern Virginia, just outside of D.C., um, and was clerking for a law firm doing business immigration law. Um, not really sure that's what I wanted to do, but that's where I was assigned. Um, and the partner who was working in charge of the business immigration section um, ended up working on a, a special project that had to do with crafting legislation for essential workers. Um, and so I got my little bit of a taste in the government relations that way by clerking at a law firm. And then kind of one thing led to another. And I can tell you the entire story of how I ended up lobbying, if this is the appropriate time or save it for later. Um, but that's basically because I got a little bit of taste of it while I was work, working for that law firm in law school, I decided that you know the right thing for me to do was probably pursue a career behind a desk um, as opposed to running around maybe as an FBI agent all over the country. Oh yeah, so yeah, I think this would be a perfect segue. Tell us like, you know, what me, so it looks like you started doing some documentation on legislation mm -hmm. and writing that stuff. And at that point, did you go to the Capitol or Capitol Hill or something and, and you fell in love with it? How, how did that happen? So the project that I was working on was uh, the Essential Worker Visa Program prior to not, uh, September 11th, 2001. Um, and um, I got some good experience doing that. Never really went up to Capitol Hill, did the research about how to, how to you know, what statutory changes would be necessary and did a little bit of bill drafting. Um, and uh, uh, the project kind of came to an end uh, with no real successful conclusion. 
uh, because of September 11th, all the statutory changes around immigration, things of that nature kind of were put on hold. Um, but uh, because I had some experience doing some legislative work and some uh, research about how laws are written and, and things of that nature, um, the next opportunity for a research assignment uh, out of our Washington DC office, I was in Northern Virginia at the time, the next opportunity for a research assignment from our government relations practice for my law firm that came over where they needed some help from a law clerk, cheap labor. Um, I was up in the queue and they said, hey, you wanna do this? And I said, yes. And this was a project uh, that ultimately came, became referred to as Justice for Victims of Terrorism. Um, and although it wasn't directly related to 9-11, um, the timing for it was obviously quote unquote good because of 9-11. Um, we, our law firm represented families who were victims of international terrorism, um, who were suing the foreign state sponsors of terrorism in federal court. Um, and there was a, a effort underway to create a path forward for those law lawsuits to go forward under something called the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act. Um, the nations that were being sued uh, were not showing up in court. And if you don't have them show up in court to defend their cases, you can't really get a judgment against them. So we passed legislation that said, um, if you don't show up in court for these lawsuits, you can still be successfully sued. So that was step one. And then step two is once you got a, a judgment against, let's say, uh, Libya in this case, um, we would be able to pursue the assets that were frozen by the Treasury Department as a result of you being designated, your country being designated as a foreign state sponsor of terrorism. Uh, we'd be able to pursue the assets that were being held by the Treasury Department to satisfy those judgments. So those were the, those were the uh, legislative initiatives that we were working on, first to amend the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act to allow for a lawsuit, and then for the satisfaction of those judgments to come from the assets of those countries. Um, so we had clients that were victims of terrorism in Israel, uh, in Libya, and actually in Iraq. Uh, the human shields that were from the first Gulf War um, that were suing uh, the nation of Iraq, just as we were entering the 2003 war in Iraq. Uh, so it was interesting timing as well. So I was brought into that project, uh, again, as someone doing some research on the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act, Immunities Act and kind of becoming a subject matter expert on that. Um, working for a very well-known lobbyist in Washington, D.C., who was representing our clients. And he started taking me up to Capitol Hill so that I could start explaining uh, the statutory changes that we would need and why and those sorts of things in the history. And then uh, after a while, he turned me over to lobbying staff and eventually lobbying members of Congress on this. So um, it was quite the experience. And I, I kind of fell in love with lobbying so much so that when I graduated law school, I put on hold taking the bar exam because uh, we were right in the middle of the major fight on Capitol Hill to pass this legislation. And interestingly enough, our biggest opponents on that legislation were the United States government, uh, the State Department and the United States Treasury Department, which were fearful of setting dangerous precedent um, by allowing for these lawsuits to go forward in United States courts. There was a fear that there would be uh, lawsuits against the United States in other countries accusing us of terrorism. So. It was a very uh, interesting experience, very eye-opening. I learned a lot. Uh, it was a bipartisan effort um, that ultimately was successful. And that amendment that we worked on served as the foundation for additional um, lawsuits going forward uh, after, from, from some of the 9-11 families, but also, also for other victims of terrorism since 9-11 and other, and other, uh, other uh, countries around the world. So it's, and I occasionally read about it. So it's uh, like, hey, I worked on that. So it's, it was, that's how I got into lobbying. Um, it was, I didn't mean to do it. And I don't think a lot of lobbyists actually mean to become lobbyists. It just kind of happens that way. And so by happenstance, it happened to me. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a pretty cool story. So after you did that, uh, it looks like you were, became the assistant director of government uh, affairs at Greenberg Tarig. Was this right That's after you graduated? <clears throat> that was the law firm in Washington, D.C. I worked for. It was Greenberg Charter. Um, oh, and, then, and then my wife and I looked at each other one day and said, we don't want to live in Washington, D.C. anymore. She grew up around there and she said, I'd like to leave. Um, and I said, that's fine. I need to take a bar exam. We need to figure out where we want to go before I decide what bar exam I'm going to take. 
Um, I was living in a neighborhood with three of my best friends from college, all of whom married their girlfriends from college. My wife was my girlfriend from college. And all of us were sitting around the dinner table one night and we said, we want to leave Northern Virginia, Washington, DC. Where do we want to go? We actually, over a glass, many glasses of wine um, and beers, uh, decided to move all of us to North Carolina together. Uh, so four couples moved down here in 2003 to 2004. Um, and uh, I took the North Carolina bar exam and passed and got my first job in North Carolina. Oh, and what was your job here? So I became the director of government relations and legislative counsel for the North Carolina Bar Association. So uh, all the lawyers in North Carolina um, who, you know, I think at the time there were about 16,000 lawyers who were members of the Bar Association. And I represented them in Raleigh and in Washington, DC. And uh, I got that job again by happenstance. Um, I was, because I was a newly minted lawyer in North Carolina, I had to take a continuing legal education program for new lawyers at the Bar Association. Um, I was, didn't have a job at the time. I was walking through the lobby. And this, this is back in the olden days before Indeed and all those other job sites. There was actually a bulletin board with the job posting hanging on it for the Director of Government Relations. And it was a Thursday. The job closed on Friday. So I went home, submitted my resume, had an interview the following week, and had the job within two weeks. So again, happenstance. I've been very lucky, uh, and it just worked out that way. Oh, that's that's really cool. And and what did you learn from that experience at the North Carolina Bar Association? Well, for me, I was very lucky because being new to North Carolina and not having uh, a degree from a North Carolina school, which I didn't realize at the time was probably the biggest impediment to me getting a job in North Carolina initially. Um, but getting the job at the Bar Association, I instantly had this network of lawyers in North Carolina because I was representing them and they were very actively involved in government relations. Um, I got to know a lot of the partners at all the law firms in Raleigh and throughout North Carolina. I got to know the entire Supreme Court and Court of Appeals on a first name basis. Um, and all the legislators who were lawyers um, instantly became kind of my, my go-to caucus of sorts at the legislative building. So I was, what I learned right away was that it's very important to have if you don't have a network moving into North Carolina to quickly establish one and figure out how to do it. Um, and I was successful in doing that by, again, by happenstance, by getting that job at the Bar Association. So if, I, if you had to like turn back the clock and then um, advise someone who's listening to this, mm -hmm. um, and if they are like, they want to get into government relations, what do you think their first step should be? Yeah, so really, figure out um, what it is you want to do in government relations. If you want to work in, in politics and work on campaigns, there's certainly a path to doing that. Uh, by, you know, whether you're Republican or Democrat, there's always someone running for office. Find someone that you can work for and work with because uh, that's a really good way to get into politics. Now, for me, obviously, I didn't do that. Um, so you, if you want to be a lobbyist, you kind of got to figure out what's important to you. Um, if there is a particular issue or cause that you're willing and really want to fight for, find an organization um, that is fighting for that cause and see if they have obviously job openings. If they don't, maybe intern for those organizations. Um, or if you're just generally interested in lobbying and not really sure what it is you wanna lobby for, um, I think it's beneficial. I've been on the receiving end of a number of different phone calls from aspiring lobbyists about you know, how did I get into it? What would I suggest? You know, are, there, are there certain issues they could follow and, people they could shadow, things of that nature. I can't stress how important it is to be as aggressive as possible in building that network. Um, even if you know you call me and you want to intern for Duke and I don't have something available, um, striking that relationship and that conversation, um, which leads to another conversation with another lobbyist, which you, another conversation with another lobbyist, it shows initiative. Um, it also shows that you have ability, the ability to make that network that is so important to being a successful lobbyist. There's very few lobbyists who only know two or three people in Raleigh, right? It's gonna be the lobbyists and the advocates who have a really broad network who are ultimately really successful. So after your um, stint at the North Carolina Bar Association, mm -hmm. I see that in your career, primarily most of your years have been spent with Duke, mm -hmm. um, except for one in between, which was with Williams Mullen. 
Yes. So um, that I'm guessing that was more of a contract lobbying position. Am I right? Exactly. exactly. And so how did you see, you know, working for our independent organizations and then working as a contract lobbyist? What was the difference in doing both of them? Yeah, no, it's a huge difference. Um, so, you know, when you're a contract lobbyist, your client pretty much sets your agenda and, and what it is that the contract lobbyist ought to be carrying out. Uh, when you're in-house, like I am right now, I pretty much set the agenda in consultation with my leadership, and then I carry it out. Um, and sometimes I hire contract lobbyists to help me with that. So it's a real difference. There's a lot more freedom uh, being in-house. Um, and, and the longer you spend, obviously, in-house, the greater responsibility and trust you develop with your leadership and the more they rely on you for, you know, I would say government relations, but then also non-government relations advice on just kind of how things operate, uh, not only in Raleigh, but just structurally and, and all the different things that affect, in my case, the health system in the university. Um, so I enjoyed being a contract lobbyist. I think one thing that I, I enjoyed about that, um, that some, con some in-house lobbyists might not experience. It's not the case for me, given how big Duke is and how many different issues I work on. When you're a contract lobbyist, you have multiple clients, multiple issues. Some in-house lobbyists then transition or in-house lobbyists only work on one specific issue or one specific topic. Um, so there's a real difference in that regard. Um, I still consider myself to be sort of a contract lobbyist in some way because of all the different constituencies that Duke that I represent, the physicians, the health system leadership, the university, the different schools, you, the nursing community, the PA community, I mean, you name it, um, Duke's got it. Um, so I, I, I enjoy that variety quite a bit still in my, in my day job as an in-house lobbyist. And um, I see that you've been um, working as a, a director of government relations, then you were the assistant vice president of government relations, um, and you were doing it between Duke University and the Duke University health system. So can you tell us like, what is the relationship between them and, and why do you think that relationship is important? Sure, yeah. Yeah, so when I first joined, uh, Duke, I was an employee of the health system, uh, working for the government relations office there. Um, but still, when I was working for the health system, I had responsibility for the university. Uh, it's just a, a weird way structurally how the government relations office was set up back then. I was a director, then a promoted to assistant vice president. And then ultimately, a few years ago, I moved over to create a new office at Duke called Duke State Relations, which is responsible for Duke University and Duke Health System. And then a joint venture we have, have with a for-profit healthcare company called Duke LifePoint, which has nine hospitals all across North Carolina. Um, so I've worked for both entities, uh, you know, technically employee of both, but I've always kind of done the same thing for both, but just with increasing levels of responsibility. Uh, the university and the health system are joined at the hip. Uh, really, the university more or less owns the health system. Um, and uh, there's a lot of collaboration, uh, and more so now than there had been before. I think there's a, a, a move towards creating this one Duke feeling uh, that the university and the health system really are one Duke, and we're all plowing in the same direction, working on the same issues, and we all share the name. Of course, we share the name with Duke Energy too, but um, you know, Duke University and Duke Health System is completely, obviously, separate from that. Um, but uh, the relationship between the, the two is critical. Um, and the governance structure is, is very complementary. Uh, Vince Price, who's the president of Duke, Univers uh, of Duke University, works very collaboratively with the Chancellor for Health Affairs, uh, Dr. Gene Washington for the health system. So um, it's really kind of seamless in, in many ways for me. And can you tell us like, you know, what kind of um, policies or legislation you've been working on and what, what do you think is really important for North Carolina? Sure, yeah. Um, so for the health system, obviously, uh, healthcare issues is, is at the top of the uh, list. Um, and at the top of that list is uh, Medicaid, um, everything related to Medicaid, whether it's Medicaid transformation, the move towards Medicaid managed care, or whether it's the move or the attempted moves towards expanding Medicaid in North Carolina, uh, the regulatory and, and statutory framework for how North Carolina delivers healthcare services is uh, at the top of the list of things that I work on, uh, increasing healthcare access, whether again, going uh, all the way from Medicaid expansion uh, to technology issues such as uh, telehealth, uh, increasing access that way. It really runs the full spectrum of healthcare issues. And then on the university side, 
Um, I work on a variety of different uh, things for the university, anywhere from driver's license issues for foreign students who are having challenges getting their driver's licenses renewed, private property issues. Duke University is a private property, uh, obviously a private institution with private property. We uh, constantly and, and seemingly annually uh, have legislation in the legislature concerning weapons on campus and free speech issues on campus, things of that nature. Um, but I think what's also sometimes lost on people is that uh, Duke is the uh, now the largest private employer in the entire state. Um, we have over 44,000 employees between the health system and the university combined. We are one of, if not the largest income tax paying entity in the state. We are a huge economic development engine in the state. So I get involved in all sorts of issues, whether it be economic development policy, tax policy, HR policy, you name it. Um, so that's why I said before, I sometimes do feel like a contract lobbyist with a number of different clients because of the number of issues that as a huge employer and a huge tax paying, income tax paying entity and a huge economic development engine for the state, uh, we're just involved in everything. Um, can you tell us like, what is the best part of working um, with Duke and what is it that you enjoy? Yeah, I mean, the best part is the people and like I had mentioned before, uh, what they are working towards, which is achieving groundbreaking, um, life-saving uh, research. I mean, we just, we, we've done great work on vaccine research just recently on COVID um, and people that are dedicating themselves and their lives work uh, and every inch of their body to that sort of work is really what I enjoy most working with uh, at Duke. Um, I forget the second part of your question. Uh, um, what is it that you enjoy? Yeah, well, that's it. I mean, I mean, like I said before, it's just the what Duke is, what Duke stands for um, as a world-renowned academic institution, healthcare, academic medical center, um, healthcare provider. Uh, that's what keeps me going. I often say, um, when the day comes that I no longer am working for Duke, will probably be the day that I'm no longer lobbying in North Carolina because of the passion that I have for the things that we're are involved with now. I just can't imagine doing it anywhere else. How much does personal politics play in your role? Zero. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> well, with that, I think we'll just move on to the last segment where you get the opportunity to speak anything about yourself, your organization, or how do you see yourself in the future? Are you going to, you know, run for office or anything like that? Anything goes. Yeah, I used to joke around with a couple of legislators who are from Holly Springs, where I live, that I was going to run for office. And I'd always say, oh, I'd love to run against the lobbyist. Uh, you know, the things that I could say and, and the ads that I could run. So I don't I don't consider myself to be have any aspirations politically. Um, I enjoy this side of working um, in government and state government issues. I enjoy the policy work more than I do probably in terms of in, in the way that I do with it. Uh, than having to make the decisions uh, that the legislators are sometimes forced to make. Um, I am uh, approaching 50, which is hard for me to say. I probably, hopefully will be done doing this in the next 10 years. Uh, we'll see what my wife has to say about that. Beyond that, I don't know, I would like to teach. Um, both, as I said, both my parents were educators. Um, I have a passion for education. I have a passion for teaching and working with young kids. Uh, I was a baseball coach uh, for my son's baseball team. I really enjoyed working with the kids. I found that that was more enjoyable than I actually thought it was going to be. I wanted to do it for my, my son's uh, purposes of spending more time with him and coaching him. But I found, you know, that I, I really enjoyed being around the kids and, and listening to them talk and about what interests them and, and helping them get to achieve their goals. Um, and so that's really kind of where I see myself going. And maybe a Duke University will ultimately someday allow me to be a a professor at Duke, maybe a guest lecturer or a professor in some capacity. But if not, and I have to move, and I ultimately move on to teaching in high school or junior high, whatever it may be, as a history, political science, American government teacher, uh, I can, I can really, I can see myself doing that as well. Um, but without a doubt, I will always have those interests that are completely removed uh, from my my work. Um, that it always will involve family and spending as much time as I possibly can outdoors. Um, I recently left the military. I was in the army for um, several years as a judge advocate, as a lawyer in the reserves. Uh, I feel like I've lost a little bit of my direction since I've left the military. So I need to find some new passion 
that is not directly connected to my day job, not directly connected to my family, but something else that I need to focus on. Uh, my wife bought me a guitar a couple of years ago. I have barely picked it up. So maybe that'll be my next passion. I just, I need to find something else to do to keep me busy. Well, thank you so much for your service. And thank you so much for spending this time with me. It was really an honor to have a conversation with you, Doug. Sure. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening to this episode with Doug Heron. It was my honor to have him on the show. If you would like to be a part of the show, I would be delighted to hear your government relations stories. Until next time, keep educating and inspiring. This is Deepak signing off.